I am an agnostic kind of person. So my question is like, we all have been encountering a statement everywhere, like on social media and in our day-to-day -day life, that our religion is in danger. First of all, this question comes in my mind since my childhood, what is religion? And the other thing, how is it in danger? And is it necessary to have a religion at all? <coughs> See, uh, let's take a few minutes, he's asked a sure. question. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. See, I want you to look back on this nation and see what is the context of this nation. If you look back on the history of this country, there was a time when there were over two hundred political entities, kings, I mean, many small kingdoms, big empires. Sometimes certain kings came and conquered and made it into larger empire, sometimes it broke into small. Largely it was been somewhere between hundred to two hundred and fifty nations within one geography of what we call as Indian subcontinent today. But though there were so many political nations, people from outside always called this land as Hindustan, yes? Even now, if you go to Arabia, let's say Lebanon and uh, Jordan and these kind of places, you will find thousands of women in Lebanon are still taking the name Hind. It's their name because in… in their language, Hind means India. I asked them first time when I went, I was surprised. Why are you taking name India? I mean, in Lebanon, why are you Indian <laughs> They say, no, this is our culture. We always connected with India. Probably these people are somebody who went long time ago. They become part of that culture and they look like that, They've, everything is like that. Must have been thousands of years ago, they must have been homesick. When you're homesick, you call your daughter India, so at least I can call India, India every day <laughs> because I'm missing my country <laughs> So that tradition is still there. But even then they called Hind or Hindustan. Though we were many nations within this subcontinent. <coughs> oh, okay. So why did they call this nation Hindustan is, one thing is it's a geographical identity. The land that lies between Himalayas and the Indusagara, which is today called as Indian Ocean, they call this Hindustan. Himalaya and Indusagara, between that is Hindu. Stan. So geographical identity, were, identity was given but not political identity, not language identity, not religious identity, this is very significant because they could not figure out who the hell we were even then. As even today you can't figure out who the hell you are, that's why you're asking this question <laughs> Even then, the same question as your uh, vice chancellor asked, Sadhguru, uh, would you answer the question, who am I? So we still can't figure out who the hell we are <laughs> Because this has been a land of seeking, never a land of belief. If you want a religion, essentially when somebody says, I am religious, they always say, I am a believer, isn't it? Let's explore this word belief. How many of you believe you have two hands? All of such people just at least raise one hand, please. <laughs> do you believe you have two hands or do you know you have two hands? We know. You know. If somebody starts an argument with you and tries to prove to you you have no two hands, if their argument becomes too overwhelming, one slap in the face, <laughs> he knows you got hands, isn't it? But. There are so many things you believe, you believe in heaven, you believe in God, you believe in many, many things. Why do you believe? Simply because you have not become straight enough in your life even to admit what I do not know as I do not know. This is a serious problem. Whatever you do not know, you say, I believe. It is so human of you, so wonderful of you, to see what you do not know as I do not know, isn't it? I do not know is a tremendous possibility. 
When you say, I do not know, genuinely within you, the longing to know, the seeking to know and the possibility of knowing becomes a living reality in your life. Otherwise, everything that you do not know, you believe. When you believe, it gives you instant confidence. Confidence without clarity is the most disastrous thing that has happened to humanity. Confidence. All kinds of idiots have confidence. When you don't know, at least you must have hesitation, isn't it? Huh? When you can't see clearly, you must have hesitation. When you can't see clearly, if you're confident, are you not a disaster? You are either a disaster for yourself or for everybody around you. So, this land was never ever identified with belief systems. This has always been a land of seekers. Seekers of what? Seekers of truth and liberation. Just now, yesterday I was at, uh, you know, the BHU in uh, Kashi. <laughs> you just see there, people are coming from all over the country and now all over the world. In search of what? Mukti. <laughs> Freedom is the highest value. God has never been the highest value in this culture. All the people whom you worship are people who walked this land at some time, isn't it? And they were not superheroes. They did not drop from the sky or fly in the air or walk up on the water, nothing. Just same grind as you are going through, much more grind than you are going through. If you want to take the example, of uh, anybody, either Shiva, Rama, Krishna, whatever the main date is in the country, let's take Rama because he's always in uh, political dispute. <laughs> he's still in a real estate problem <laughs> At the age of seventeen or eighteen, he's been coronated as a king, rightfully because whatever those days, his father and son. He marries a young princess, in a short while, some political situation, something goes wrong and they're banished to a forest. Well, in your television, whatever you saw or in some movie you saw Ra Rama Sita doing uh, honeymoon in the forest, no, it was an exile. Going to the jungle is not a picnic, most of you may not know. I've lived in jungles by myself alone without any outside support. After three weeks when I came back home, my mother would look at me, she couldn't recognize me because from head to toe, insect bites, this, that, you know. You cannot be recognized, especially if you take girls. When they come out after two, three weeks, you cannot recognize them because everything will be swollen, all kinds of things will happen to you if you live in the jungle. So taking a young wife and going, she's not a tribal woman, she's a princess, Going to the forest was not picnic or honeymoon, it was an exile. As if that was not bad enough, the Sri Lankan people came and kidnapped the wife <laughs> Yes? <laughs> Happened, right? <laughs> now, he's a king after all. If one wife goes, he could have found a local solution. <laughs> a king is entitled to have many wives, but one is gone, he could have found somebody next to him, but the man loves the woman so much. In those days, no GPS, you don't know <laughs> you don't know where exactly Sri Lanka is located. <laughs> Just him and his brother walk, I want you to imagine the walk from Ayodhya to southern India. Not a simple search. How many people will search for a lost wife six, seven thousand years ago walking two thousand plus kilometers, how many men would have done that? So, he walked and formed a Tamil army, then went to Sri Lanka, burned down a beautiful city, fought a war, killed hundreds of people, got back his wife. If a man has to do this, that woman should mean so much to him to do such an act, isn't it? Then he brought her back. Again he became a king, again something goes wrong, by then she's pregnant. See, a king's wife or a queen being pregnant means it's not just a pregnancy, it's the future of the nation. It is a big thing, it's not a small thing. And he's a big emperor by then, 
but something goes wrong and he sends his wife to the jungle again. No sonogram, so doesn't know whether it's a boy or girl, boys or girls or what. It's not a small thing for a king, if it's going to be a son, it's important for the future of his everything. But he doesn't know, sends his wife away to the jungle. Then she delivers two boys, he doesn't know. If something really, really horrible has to happen in anybody's life, knowingly or unknowingly you kill your own children, this is the worst thing that can happen to you, isn't it? He almost killed his own children. He fought a battle with them, nearly killed, he had intent to kill, not knowing they are his children. Fortunately, it did not happen. But anyway, he never again saw his wife, she died in the jungle. You don't call this a success story, isn't it? Hello? You don't call this a success story. Then why are we worshipping this man? Why is this man celebrated as a great whatever? Simply because no matter what life threw at him, most people would break if one of those situations happened in their life. He is a serial disaster. But in spite of all this, he did not become angry, he did not become resentful, hateful, he managed his balance all the time did not withdraw, active, doing the best he can and that's about it. And after he came back from Sri Lanka, he did something fantastic. After having killed Ravana, he wanted to take a year of penance in the Himalayas. Lakshmana, his, sir, his brother said, are you crazy? You killed the man and we had to kill him, he took his wife, your wife. So why are you… why do you… why do you have to do penance for that man? He said, see, he had ten qualities. The nine qualities I killed, I have no regret. But he was also a great devotee and I killed that also along with everything else. For that I have to do penance. Because the man is free from whatever is happening around him, you throw the most horrible things at him, he is just who he is. This freedom is called Jivan Mukti. It is for that freedom that we bow down to him, not because he's a great hero, not because he's a great success. So, in this culture, in this culture, the only valuable thing is that you attain to freedom from the process of life. Life… what life throws at you is never your choice. It will throw all kinds of things at you. What will you make out of it? This is your choice, isn't it? So, we always told you in this culture, never in this… now people are beginning to say this Uparwala business, otherwise, in this culture, we always told you, your life is your karma, yes or no? What does it mean to you? It simply means your life is your making. Nobody up there sitting and managing your life. Well, you're on a round planet and the damn thing is spinning, you don't even know which side is up. Hello? Do you know which side is up in this cosmos? I'm asking you. Is it marked somewhere, this side up? So you do not even know which side is up, but you know who is up. <laughs> this is a serious problem. No, it's not a laughing matter because it's taking lives. It's not taking… it's taking lives does not mean people are being killed, it's… that's also is happening, that's a different matter. But it's taking lives because instead of creating your life, you're looking up and walking. When forever we told you, your life is your karma, what you make out of it is all there is. What is thrown at you is not in your hands, what you make out of it is one hundred percent yours. So the idea is just this, the fundamental ethos of this culture is not religion. This is a godless country, I want you to know this. There never been the god up there. We worship a few people. In… you know, it's very appropriate, today people are saying Tendulkar is cricketing god. Whoever excelled in any aspect of life beyond a certain point, which we considered is normal human… human being, if somebody excelled, then we say, oh, he's godlike, he's a deva. This word god as a supreme entity never has been here. Here we are always talking about those who have excelled beyond what we normally consider as human, as devas. That's why we have thirty-six million gods and goddesses. You must create more, there's no problem. 
because after all, this is the only and only culture in the on the planet which understands God is our making. Everybody thinks they are God's making. Right now, Vinayak Chaturthi celebrations are going on around the country. See, this is a classic example where we create the God, we will put him there, next ten days or one month, whatever, our entire life is around him, full emotion, bhajan, dance, music, whole thing. But when the time comes, we go and dissolve him in water. We made the God, we worshipped him, we enjoyed it, we enthused ourselves in a big way using him. When we are done, we dissolved him. This clearly shows you we have an innate understanding God is our making, isn't it? So, here we have only had a spiritual process, variety of spiritual processes, but never religion. We became religious in competition. When outside forces came and too much competition, we are also trying to organize, but you can never organize this culture because if there are three people, there are five opinions. Within the same house, there are ten gods. How do you make a religion out of that? No, this is just a process. You use everything for your emancipation, for your liberation. If you s listen to the conversations of your mothers or maybe your young people, your grandmothers, not some spiritual conversation, daily conversation if you listen to it, without uttering the words karma, prarabdha, mukti, moksha, there's no conversation in this country. Constant reminder, no matter what you're doing, your education, your family, your business, your spirituality, everything is only towards your liberation, always. Freedom is the highest goal, not heaven, not God. Thank you.